everyone for uh, tuning in today to this lecture. Hopefully, you know, I'll make it as interesting and as edifying uh, for people as possible. So without further ado, I'm going to shrink myself down here and get right into the lecture. So today I'm going to be presenting on a topic that probably some of you are familiar with, which is the idea of latent pathogens and specifically their role in chronic illness and sort of treatment methodology for that and how different people approach this idea. Now I say from Gu de Fu Xie, uh, Gu is, is like a term that probably in America people are quite familiar with um, because Heiner Freuhoff has done a lot of research on this and also developed a really nice methodology in clinic for using um, Gu as a way of thinking about latent pathogens. Um, so I use that as sort of a reference point. And then what I'm going to do today is I'll talk a little bit about Gu, but I'm also going to be talking about um, how other people treat latent pathogens and think about latent patho pathogens and try to bring it all together. So before I get into that though, um, originally the uh, the holders of this conference uh, had told me that they, they wanted me, to, or they, they suggested maybe that I could speak on the chow vessels uh, because I wrote a book, which is over here, the archeology span of the chow vessels, um, which is available uh, through Amazon and also at the Purple Cloud Institute website. But I've already written a, a lot on this and I've also actually done some YouTube lectures on that. I've done three YouTube lectures on it. Um, and so what I would say is if you're interested in this stuff, please um, go and check out my YouTube channel and you can just, these are hour long lectures where I go into some of uh, the more difficult concepts in, in my book. And of course you can check out my book as well. There's There are um, samples available on Purple Cloud Institute and also on, on Amazon. So I feel like I've kind of talked enough about this topic and I want to do something new. So we're going to move into um, latent pathogens after this. Now, in terms of the, the idea behind this conference, right? I, I really like the, the uh, theme of this conference, which is about this idea of there are so many different traditions in Chinese medicine. How do we actually integrate these all in practice? And so I want to just give a, a few quick ideas on this. My first would be to say, when you're studying any one tradition, study it thoroughly and make sure you completely understand it before moving on to other things. Don't try to dabble in many things at once because you'll get ideas confused. Okay, so really have one thing in, in in, in your mind at a time. For instance, if you're going to study tongue acupuncture, just study tongue acupuncture and really get that down before you move on to something else. That'll help you later when you're trying to integrate. Now, my second point would be <clears throat> really study the classics, okay? Because everyone draws in the classics. So if you have an idea of the, those foundational texts, You'll be, you'll be able to understand how different people are just drawing on those. Different traditions are growing out of them. It'll be easier to integrate them. So things that I would say are the inner canon, the Shanghan Lun, or the Treatise on Cold Damage, classic of difficulties. Now, in terms of acupuncture, I would say you would also maybe want to look at the, the Great Compendium, as well as the Odes. And then if you speak, speak Chinese, I would also... Uh, recommend looking at Yang Weijie's Zhen Jiu Bao Dian. Okay, and in terms of herbs, I think, in my personal opinion, you really need to get the Shang Han Lun and Jing Guo Yao Liu down. Then you can move on to other stuff because everything grows out of that. Now, the next thing would be to understand when you're when you're looking at just one tradition, what do you focus on? First, their foundational theory. What are what are the how how are they um, building up their theory, and then and then importantly, how are they connecting that to clinic? So they're, the way that that's collected to um, to clinic is to see how they make decisions about treatment via the theories they have, and also their specific diagnostics. 
Okay, so you want to be really clear on these things, both their theories and their diagnostics, right? So, for instance, in, in Ho Sam Pai, you might be very clear about, oh, okay, they use sort of um, have a, a theory of, you know, supplementing yang and, and yang always being deficient. But if you don't also know about their pulse system and have a very good idea of, of how they make decisions about treating patients based upon pulse, you don't really know the, the Ho Sam Pai or the, the, the fire god school, right? So that's the next thing. Now, the last thing I would say is to read Huang Yu and Tang Zhonghai. Now, unfortunately, these guys aren't really available in English, but if you read Chinese, I really recommend them. Huang Yu, why I say you should read him is because he integrates a lot of different stuff. He integrates Yin Yang Wu Xing, then six confirmations and the 12 channels in one system. So if you have that, this guy's theoretical system in your mind, it'll be a lot easier to jump between different things. Now, the next thing, of course, is this lecture today, I'm going to try to do, I'm kind of going to try to practice what, what I preach, in that I'm going to show how different traditions approach the idea of latent pathogens. Okay, so we'll look at um, the idea of Gu and Hiram Freuhoff, and then we'll look also at Li Ke. And if we have time, we will also look at Wu Xiongzi. Um, but the, the idea is I'm also going to start with foundations and then look at how they use their theories and diagnostics to make decisions in clinic, right? So hopefully, hopefully by doing this, um, it will also really fit the theme of this conference. So let's start off by defining what is uh, latent pathogen disease. Uh, we've talked a little bit that it, it has, you know, in the West, people might know it in terms of Gu and the Heiner Freuhoff school. In the, the China, it's, it's often ca it's called Fu Xie. Um, and so what does it actually refer to in terms of like, clin like clinical practice, right? Well, first of all, I think what I want to say is that it's really kind of just a theory of how disease develops and then a methodology different methodologies for treating it. And it's a very specific, it's sort of a specific kind of way in which the disease develops. Um, and because of that, it can have a, it can actually encompass a, a vast variety of diseases. Um, and so for instance, <clears throat> we'll, we'll look at most today um, is, is Li Ke's uh, usage of, of um, latent pathogen um, methodologies. And so he treats uh, chronic inflammatory and autoimmune diseases often um, using this latent pathogen sort of method. But that being said, um, in the Gu school or the, the Gu method uh, of uh, Heiner Freuhoff, um, he'll treat stuff like Lyme and these other sort of uh, chronic infectious diseases and uh, another guy named Wu Xiongzi in, in China also does something like that where he treats Epstein-Barr and hepatitis. And then of course, something like uh, long COVID, I think to a degree, will also fall under this umbrella, we'll see. And I think that'll become um, pretty obvious as, as we go on here. And I explain the sort of mechanism for how latent pathogen disease works. So where do we, where does this idea come from? Um, of, of latent pathogen. Well, probably the earliest example is in the Su Wen 3, chapter 3, where it says if patient experiences cold damage in the winter, they will suffer warm disease come spring. So this idea that the person is sort of invaded by a pathogen in the winter, and then um, it lodges in the body, and then come springtime, somehow it reactivates and becomes this warm disease in the spring, right? So that's been interpreted a lot of different ways by a lot of different people. Now, the next big quote I would say is comes from the treatise on cold damage. And it's similar. It says, if in the beginning of spring, we see this strong heat effusion, this exterior pattern, well, this is due to yang qi effusing outwards in spring as the latent cold from winter transforms into warm disease. So again, this idea of this cold that attacked 
it invaded and lodged in the body in the winter. Once we get to spring and yang qi is fusing outwards, um, we get um, this activation of this latent cold. Okay, so that, that's the idea there. Um, and now we'll, we'll go into a lot more detail about how that works. So first let's look at the, the cold aspect when the cold is invading. Well, in the Ling Shu 66, we see a very detailed account of what goes on there. So um, for instance, the pathogen, let's, let's imagine it's cold in this case, it attacks and strikes the skin, and then it goes deeper and deeper into the body, right? It goes into the interstices, and ultimately it even goes into um, the, it, it lodges deeper and deeper into the stomach, the intestines, and the vessels. Um, it starts to affect these network vessels surrounding the intestines, right? So then it says, very importantly, if the vessels of the stomach and intestines are damaged, right, by this cold, and the intestines are cold, blood and fluid mix and congeal, lodging intractably, okay? So what's going on there? You have this cold that, that invades, right? And then what happens is once it lodges within, it actually starts to cause some damage. And this damage uh, manifests as things like blood stagnation, like room, like phlegm, like dampness, right? And so now you have what I'm going to call these pathogenic substances in the body. And then at the same time, the cold is kind of lodged in there as well, lodged inside of them. Okay, so that's the first aspect of what happens. Now, the second is, what about this spring? So we have the cold, now spring comes. What does this spring mean in this idea of warm disease? Well, just empirically, in the spring, we'll see that a lot of latent pathogen diseases tend to crop up. For instance, this rheumatoid arthritis um, and a lot of other diseases tend to somehow get worse in the spring. Now, what is the meaning of this spring, this warm disease? Well, the first important thing is, like we saw in the Shanghan Lun, it said upright qi is being activated outwards. This wei qi and ying qi is, is where it was being, con it, this warmth was being conserved in the winter. Now we're pushing outwards because we've got to get rid of heat because it's getting hot, right? And so this ying and wei are circulating in a much wider uh, sort of territory of the body. They're moving outwards. And as they move outwards and activate, they might also activate this latent pathogen, right? Now, the second aspect of this, which is also important, is warm disease, in this case, can also just mean any sort of, once you already have a latent pathogen, any sort of second exterior insult, right? So maybe you get another cold or something like that. And what does that do? It again activates this upright chi. So either the upright chi is nat naturally activating as a result of, of, of springtime, and we can also see this as um, activating, for instance, at certain times of day. For instance, like in the morning, a lot of people get allergies in the morning because upright chi is sort of activating at that time. Or it can be as a result of some sort of cold or something like that, which, is, which activates the, the, the upright chi to attack outwards. So this is, now we're going to look at some schematics here for, for how latent pathogen disease works. This is like the physiological model, um, basically where, where we have the circulation of, of upright qi. So we have ying, ying qi moving out from the middle burner to the surface. We have wei qi moving out from, from the lower burner to the surface. We have it circulating back in. And we also have this ying qi flushing down into the, the organs and the bowels. Um, again, so this, this sort of model of circulation, I don't really have time to go into all the details um, of that, but here are, I on the left side here, we have a model for Wei Qi. On the right side here, we have a model for Ying Qi, so you can take a picture of that or pause the screen, just have a look if need be. Now, 
what happens in winter? Okay, well, the interesting thing here is that in, um, we need to look at this quote from Ling Shu 66, where it says, if wind, rain, cold, and heat do not occur in the context of deficiency, these pathogens alone do no harm. So what does that mean? When we have this exterior evil, if Ying Qi is solid, if, if the upright Qi is strong, it's going to repel this exterior evil. So the fact that it, it is able to invade is a sign that we're starting off in this latent pathogen model with a person who already has sort of compromised upright Qi, okay? And so when the exterior evil invades, it's able to penetrate inwards, okay? Because of this weak, because we have this, this very weak uh, upright chi. Now, the second thing that's going to happen in this situation, right, is that now upright chi is struggling against this exterior evil, right? And so what's that doing? It's actually leading to even more deficiency of upright chi. And so Chen Jianguo says, after a long period in which upright chi can continually tries to expel the pathogen, the body becomes continually weaker and yang qi deficiency results. So that's the first thing we have to know. In this latent pathogen situation, the person has compromised upright qi, and that's what allows this exterior evil to invade and lodge inwards. Now, the next thing that's going to happen, as we said, was as this let's say in, in the, the idea of winter, this cold invades, starts to, um, through this process of struggle, through this process of the cold lodging, it starts to produce these, these pathogenic substances like blood and fluid, um, mixing and congealing and, ca and causing phlegm, blood stagnation, room, damp, et cetera, right? <clears throat> and so, so, so in that case, it also sort of starts to like encapsulate that, that cold and the cold becomes that much more intractable because of these pathogenic substances. At the same time, we still have this exterior block to a degree because well, the upright chi was unable to um, expel it. And so this makes it even harder for this uh, cold to escape because we still have a blocked exterior. Okay, so now what happens? Now, now we get to what? Springtime, right? So in spring, what's going to happen is, let's say, for instance, we're looking at spring like um, a new warm disease is coming, a new exterior evil is coming. So now what happens? All of a sudden, upright chi is activated, right? It's activated outwards. So we see... This, this line is, is thicker, it's this strong upright chi. And so if it's, if it's activated against this exterior evil, it'll also be activated against this remnant cold latent pathogen. Now, when that occurs, because we still have this remnant exterior block, because the, the exterior, this, this pathogen, this cold is sort of ensconced in, in these pathogenic substances, it's not able to expel. It's not able to expel outwards, right? And so what happens? You get this kind of counterflow upwards and you get this heat potentially also occurring. So this is the, the next really important part of latent pathogens, seeing that once you get this, this recurrent upright chi activation, then you start to get this, this heat, you have this counterflow, you have all sorts of um, discomfort occurring. Now, now finally, um, what I have here is that over time, upright chi just gets weaker and weaker. And so that's, I'm symbolizing that with this, this dotted line, right? And so as that occurs, two things happen. First, first the range of this pathogenic substance, this room and this blood stagnation and so forth expands. And then also this 
cold or whatever other, you know, you can think cold, wind, damp, etc. these exteriorly invading sub, um, pathogens get further and further ensconced within this pathogenic substance, right? And so it becomes harder and harder to expel it. And then upright chi is also weaker and weaker. So it has less and less of a, uh, an ability to expel, right? And so you, you with every successive um, new activation of upright chi, you might get this heat, this counterflow, and this expansion of the, the overall paradigm, right? And so that is really what's going on from, a, from a, um, the perspective of this, this graphic representation. So just to summarize, let's go through the, the progression of the latent pathogen mechanism. So the first thing that's gonna happen, right, is you have this exterior evil and it's in the context of weak upright chi. So that allows the upright chi to invade inwards, right? Because the, sorry, the, the exterior evil to invade inwards because the upright chi is too weak, right? And so as it invades and lodges within, we also get the creation of these path pathogenic substances like this, this phlegm and um, blood stagnation and so forth. Now, the next part of this, which is sort of like the spring part, is we have this new upright chi activation, either because of time of year or because of another exterior evil coming in. And so what does that do? It sort of activates the upright chi. And we get, because the upright chi is unable to fully expel the uh, gin, the cold or the, the wind or, or what have you, we get this sort of, counterflow right as because we have this this sort of resistance right to to this pressure outwards and cause this counterflow or causes heat or other symptoms discomfort right now this this process sort of just repeats itself over and over and upright chi becomes increasingly weak and unable to expel the pathogen and the surface is, is blocked again so it's even further unable to expel that pathogen. And as a result, um, these pathogenic substances like the phlegm and then the cold, they lodge even, in, even deeper and they also expand their, their range as well. Now, ultimately, you could say sort of like the last step in this is that these pathogenic substances, they kind of serve as what you call like a fortress for the pathogen, the, the the pathogen becomes completely en en ensconced um, within them, and it becomes that much harder to uh, to expel them. Now, that could be something like cold, right? Or it could be, uh, uh, you know, in a modern sense, something like a, a bacteria or something like that, where we say, like, in um, you know, there's some theories of in Lyme disease that the spirochets sort of form these these shells and something like an antibiotic as, as a result can't really get into them. It's sort of the same idea, okay? So now let's look at this in uh, like a clinical context. And so the first thing that I wanna look at, right, is goo because people kind of know goo, right? Now, now uh, goo is an idea that, that Heiner Freuhoff has sort of developed. He's made a method out of it, but I'm just gonna go back to the original text Right, and so in this original text, which is Zhu Gu Xin Fa, or sort of new methods for for treating Gu, um, which is a Qing Dynasty text by Lu Sun De, um, Lu says, for all Gu with exterior patterns with coughing and qi counterflow, tight bloating in the stomach and latent replete heat, presenting with yellow urine. In these situations, you can use this formula called Su He Tang or Jia Jian Su He Tang, which are the formulas um, upon which the, the thunder pearls um, and the, I believe the lightning pearls um, are, are based on. So if we look at this, we have sort of all of the elements of 
a latent pathogen uh, dynamic, you could say, right? So first of all, they're all goo, right? So in this case, the pathogen that we're speaking of is going to be this goo. Now, what is goo? It's a little bit difficult to describe. Maybe one way we can think of it is just a parasite. Okay, so this parasite uh, invades. Upright chi is not sufficient to expel it outwards, right? And so it lodges in there. Okay, now as it lodges, also we start in the upright chi can't expel it. We start to get these pathogenic substances um, starting to, to form uh, um, especially dampness in the case of Jajian uh, Su He Tang or the, the lightning and thunder pearls. Now, again, he says in the context of exterior patterns. So, so in this, um, these goo formulas, there's the assumption that there's also uh, some sort of exterior evil. And that could be damp, it could be cold, it could be wind, right? And so this is just the same. When we have this, this new exterior evil invading, what happens? We get an activation of this upright chi, right? And so when we get an ex activation of the upright chi, what's going to happen? Well, you get this, what's represented by this red arrow here and this, this red explosion, which is coughing and chi counterflow, tight bloating the stomach and latent replete heat, right? Because as this upright chi is activated and tries to push out these pathogens and pathogenic substance, it meets with resistance. And so you get this bloating in the stomach, you get this coughing, all this counterflow, and notably also heat, right? So this, this completely uh, chimes with the the idea we already have of of what the latent pathogen sort of dynamic or mechanism is. So using this model, we can also look at the the herbs in Jajian Suhadang or in uh, the lightning and thunder pearl sort of base formula, right? And so we can see first of all we have this, this one set of herbs, San Leng E Zhu, Dang Gui, Chuan Chong, Ding Xiang, which we can say are sort of aimed at what? The pathogen and the pathogenic substances, right? So sort of in this, this area right here. So San Leng E, e Zhu um, are good for parasites. Then you have like Dang Gui, Chuan Chong, which you could say are, is good for the blood stagnation that might occur. And then Ding Xiang also for this sort of like dampness or this phlegm, et cetera, that's blocking the, the middle burner. And so all of these address sort of what you can say is the pathogen and pathogenic substance aspect of the, the latent pathogen disease. And also this Dangui Chuan Chong, I, I believe they also have sort of anti-parasitic effects. Um, I know that... Um, Froehoff, part of what he wanted to do was select herbs that had sort of a strong ability to sort of an anti, um, whether it be antibacterial or antiviral um, components. That's that's what that's another thing that he was looking for on top of everything else. Now, also included in this formula, you have zisu bai zi chuan chong. Then in the original, this would be what you see in the lightning and thunder pearls, and then the original formula also of boho, chaihu, qinghao, zilan, right? And so all of these formulas, well, all of these herbs, what are they doing? They're helping to expel, they're helping to open up the exterior, right? Because you still have this remnant exterior block, which is part of what um, is blocking the ability of upright qi to, to push outwards, right? Now, the other important thing, interesting thing about that, especially if you look at, for instance, uh, zisu, uh, bohe, uh, zilan, these herbs, um, bai zi to a degree as well, they're all very highly aromatic herbs. And so that's part of this methodology of sort of uh, 
what he says is like um, smoking out the the pathogen, sort of using these 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 very aromatic herbs that that at once can open up the exterior and also break down the this dampness and all of this congealed substance right that's a that's occurring um, as a result of the latent pathogen especially in the Lingnan area of uh, Guangxi and Guangdong where these formulas come from where you have this really damp environment having these aromatic substances is quite helpful now the last also important herb in this uh, formula is also or one of them is uh, Huangqi, right? To address what? This upright qi deficiency, okay? Now, finally, you could say we have what you call these fortress herbs. Now, I think to a degree, probably what I was talking about, any of these aromatic herbs qualify for that as they're breaking up that congealed um, substance that's occurring in the context of this um, sort of seesaw battle between the upright chi and the, the pathogen, but especially zisu, uh, baizu, dingxiang, that the aromatic quality of these um, is quite strong. And so, as you can see, using this, having a strong foundation, a uh, theoretical foundation based in these classics, allows us to really easily break down what this formula is doing, right? And now we'll see also that then we can very easily relate it to another very important uh, latent pathogen practitioner, the great uh, Li Ke of China. So that'll be the next thing that we'll look at. Just a brief introduction of Li Ke for those who don't know who he is. He is this guy pictured over here on the right. He passed away in 2012. Unfortunately, I think at the age of around 87. So uh, Deng Tietao, who is one of the, sort of like the big papa of the 20th century in terms of Ch Chinese medicine, he's thought of as sort of a very, very high and important figure in Chinese medicine in China. He said that Li Ke was a great pillar of Chinese medicine in the 20th century. So, so very high praise. And when he released his book, on grave and intractable, intractable uh, medical conditions, it literally sent shockwaves through the Chinese medical community. And very soon, uh, whole hospitals, departments were set up that were just basically emulating his, his methodologies. Um, and you, he, special, he does everything. He's a generalist, but he definitely, um, he, he was very interested in sort of modern uh, illnesses that, that were still not treated very well by, by Western medicine. So cancer or also these autoimmune and chronic illnesses. So, he, so his latent pathogen methodology uh, addresses these autoimmune and chronic um, illnesses as we shall see. So this approach, in, it, we can entirely incorporate it into our already existing model, but there are just some things that we should know. Now, first of all, um, Li Ke says, all illness begins at the exterior and infiltrates into the interior. The surface is the entry for exterior pathogens and is also the exit point. So for him, he's really going to uh, emphasize that the, the importance of expelling the pathogen out through the exterior. And any way that he can do that will be very important for, for him and his methodology. Now, the second aspect of Li Ke's approach that's very important is the middle burner um, and this, this idea of uh, deficiency, right? So the middle burner is chiefly important in this pathogenesis, he says. The middle burner deficiency is what allows the pathogen to invade and become latent, as we've said. So again, another really important thing for Lika is going to be uh, this supplementation of the middle burner. So what's Lika's approach? Well, to put it very simply, it's he calls it the draw and thrust method. Okay, so 
the draw means to supplement upright upright chi, and he has a, a couple ways of doing that. Now the thrust method is going to be to unblock the exterior. So the thrust is a little bit more complicated. So one aspect of it is unblocking the exterior, right? Then using what he calls special, he has special fortress herbs. We talked about those fortress before, which are going to dislodge the pathogen, right? That's stuck in here in this sort of miasma of, of pathogenic substances. And then the, he has special herbs also, that, that some that dislodge and then others that very much thrust the, the pathogen out of that miasma. So that's his draw and thrust approach. And we'll see that uh, manifested in two different ways. The first, is called the Chuan Wu method. And then the second is called the Xiao Qing Long Tang uh, method. So both of these formulas uh, derive from the Shang Han Lun. So I said, you know, this is why you, it's really important to, to know your, your classics, right? And so the Chuan Wu method comes from Wu Tou Tang. And then Xiao Qing Long Tang method, of course, comes from Xiao Qing Long Tang. And then he, he adds to them uh, and sort of modifies them specifically for use in latent pathogen disease. Right, so the first method that we'll look at is the Chuang Wu method, okay? And so it's based on Wu Tou Tang, as I said. Um, and he uses this, Li Ke uses this in rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and other illnesses uh, that manifest with these these joint issues, the swelling of joints, and so forth. So in this, in Lika's analysis, the pathogen in this context is rooted really deep. So that's one aspect of it. Now, the other aspect of it is that the patients are often quite, have quite depleted uh, upright chi as a result of having been on steroids for a long time. So in this method, what he does is he first draws, and what that means is he first strongly up, up, um, supplements upright chi, and then he does the thrust, which, so, so let's go through that again. He first draws, and then what happens? Then he looks to see that he gets some sort of activation of upright chi, some sign that the, the pathogen um, has, is now in, in sort of a, a, a struggle or a resistance with upright chi. And so that would be heat and uh, counterflow, swelling of the joints, et cetera. Then what does he do? Then he thrusts. So at that point, he then uses herbs that open up the exterior and push the, the pathogen outwards. Now, why Chuan Wu? Well, actually, uh, Chuan Wu is, is quite an important herb in latent pathogen theory. And so Wang Xiamin, who is another uh, fire god school guy, um, says of Chuang Wu, it has the power, power to break through all barriers, moving inwardly to unblock the organs, upward to the head, downward to the cinnabar field, out to the skin, right? It goes from the channels all the way down to the smallest network vessels, and there's no place it doesn't penetrate. With the power of a trenchant knife, it cuts through dampness, stagnation, phlegm, and toxic congealments. In case of severe stagnant evil or toxic evil, it completely expels the pathogen in the twinkle of an eye with earth-shattering force. So he really waxes poetic there, but really getting to the point that Chuang Wu is one of these herbs that can really break up that, that signature aspect of a latent pathogen, which is that it sort of coheres and, and becomes ensconced within a pathogenic substance, right? And so that ability to cut through that dampness and stagnation and to push all the way out to the, uh, the extremities in the skin is, is very unique to Chuang Wu. So let's look at a case study now where, where we see uh, Li Ke using this, this model, right? This Chuang Wu model. So this is a seven, uh, 58 year old woman who had rheumatoid arthritis 
for 17 years. She has almost no finger mobility. And during changes in the weather, it becomes even more unbearable. So Lika feels her pulse and he finds that the three right pulses disperse upon pressing and are very faint in the middle and deep positions. So this tells him that the yang qi is, is quite uh, deficient, right? And also a little bit unrooted. So to use, and this is probably because the person has been on these uh, steroids for, for such a long time. Now to use exterior opening um, and expelling herbs right away, you might risk um, uprooting qi even further and getting into a desertion scenario. So you have to first, and also the upright qi is just so weak that it just doesn't have the, the ability to even struggle against and try to expel um, the pathogen. So you first have to supplement upright qi. So what does he do? He uses a few sets of herbs here. So the first set that he uses is Fuzi Li Zongtang, right? So that's set number one is using Fuzi Li Zongtang. Uh, very high dose. We don't have to necessarily go at that dose. The second one that he uses is this Dangui Bu Tang, right? Which is uh, Bei Huang Qi plus Dangui. And notice that Huang Qi is a very high dose. He uses this Sheng Jiang and Da Zao. Da Zao. Um, again, supplementing this middle and, and, and um, also in, in um, Li Ke's thought, this is a very important herb to sort of, sort of um, as you could say, sort of gently start to move in and way. So that would be start to, to, to slowly open up that exterior but not in a, a way that'll uh, uproot qi, right? Now, next we have um, what this is called shen si wei, the, the four herbs of the kidney. And so this is again, just sort of his uh, formula, tu si zi bu gu zi, go qi zi, ning, ying yang huo, which he uses to specifically uh, supplement the kidney. So he has an idea that in intractable diseases, you have to, uh, you have to supplement the two roots, the two roots being the stomach and the kidney, right? And so the Fuzi Li Zongtang for, for sort of the middle burner or the, the stomach and then this uh, four herbs of the kidney uh, being for the, um, the, the lower burner there. And so this is drying out, right? This is powerfully supplementing and allowing, activating that upright qi. So now after supplementing what happens in the second visit, the fingers are now even more swollen and hot to the touch, but the pulse is slightly more rooted. So, you know, for some doctors, they say, oh, oh dear, now I've, I've screwed up. Now the fingers are even more swollen and hot to the touch. The, the, the entire progression of the illness has actually gotten worse. But actually, this is exactly the outcome that uh, Li Ke wants. And the reason for that is because it's a sign for him that this upright qi has recovered. And also you can see that in, in the pulse being slightly more rooted, right? Now, once this upright qi is recovered, that means that it starts to struggle against this um, path pathogen, right? This cold or wind, right? it starts to try to push it to the surface where as before it was deeply rooted within and there was no upright chi even challenging it. And so this is the sign uh, that, that Lika is looking for. So then what does he do? He pivots to the thrust method, right? So the thrust method is basically his, his chuang wu method. Um, it consists of uh, a modified Wu Tou Tang, right, with Chang Wu at 30 grams, Ma Huang at 10, Gan Cao at 60, Feng Qi at 500, obviously insanely high dose. Um, but we can just say, well, okay, he used Wu Tou Tang, right, minus Bai Cao, okay? And then if there's no sweat, then he's going to go up by 5 grams per day. He's starting at a 
relatively for for Lika low dose <laughs> for other people a regular dose and then on top of that he has this formula of feng feng he xiao dou feng mi sheng zhang da zao now this this formula is purely for chuan wu okay this is purely just to uh, make sure that the the toxicity of Tuan Wu is dealt with because it's a very toxic herb. Now, on top of that, he's also using, again, at the same time that, that he's thrusting, he's still also making sure to uh, take care of the upright qi. Why? Because as you thrust outward, you're using a lot of upright qi, right? And this person is fairly deficient. So you use Ganjang Gali Shen. So this is sort of a little bit like a um Bi Zhong Tang because you also have Gan Cao, right? You're just missing Bai Zhu. Alright, so that's that's the idea here. Now next you have another very important herb, which is Xi Xin. Now Xi Xin for Li Ke is really his most important thrust herb. Okay, so so his fortress herb, you can say, well, one of them we talked about was this Chuang Wu, it can break through all of that congealment, all of those pathogenic substances. Now, Xi Xing, what does it do? It can really thrust out cold that's locked within the this miasma, right? So that's the power of Xi Xing. That's his, his main herb for doing that for um, in, in cases of, of cold that's in your that, that's ensconced in, in the pathogenic substance. Okay, so he uses Xi Xing. If it's if it's ensconced in blood, in the blood level, he uses Hei Jie Hui. If it's ensconced, if it's heat that's trapped, he uses uh Xi Xian Cao. Okay, but but really what he uses the most is Xi Xing. Now, finally, he uses two other herbs here, Chen Xie and Wu Gong. Now, Chen Xie and Wu Gong um, are herbs that can um, burrow deep into these network vessels and these dark places, right? They're these, these insect herbs. And so they're the other, besides Chuang Wu, they're the other, we call like the, the main fortress herbs that are breaking through these congealments and these uh, deep rooted uh, pathogen pathogenic substances to allow the 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 pathogen to 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 expel outwards. So after doing this, I didn't include it, but after doing this, um, the patient is on this formula for I think five packets or so and sees a dramatic uh, decrease in swelling, a dramatic decrease in symptoms, and then over the course of a couple months what Lika will do is he'll sort of seesaw back and forth. When the person starts to experience certain symptoms like a lack of appetite or they feel extremely fatigued, that's when he knows that he's done too much thrusting and he needs to go back to drawing, which is again using this Fu Zili Zhong Tang plus um, this bu, the Dang Wei Bu Xue Tang base, right? And so in this delicate seesaw act going back and forth um, over the course of, of a, a month or so, the, the patient completely recovers um, from this rheumatoid arthritis uh, that they had suffered from for, for 17 years. Now let's quickly look at, at the next method of uh, Li Ke's and that's called the Xiao Qinglong Tang method. Now, this one is used uh, primarily for illnesses of the respiratory and cardiac systems that are more intractable, and that would be something like asthma, emphysema, uh, allergic rhinitis, even coronary arter artery disease. Now, one thing that Lika is really looking for from a clinical uh, presentation is he wants to see some panting, coughing, or swelling. Okay, that's, that's one of his criteria. Lika tends to have very simple criteria when he's using formulas. Now, there are, other, there are a couple other principles involved with this. The first one is the path, of, guiding along the path of least resistance. So in these scenarios, we have um, 
as, as he says, this is like a, a Taiyang illness that is sort of penetrated inwards and becomes sort of like a Taiyin illness. So um, the Taiyang is the pathway that disease enters and it's also its exit point. The chest is the pivot point of Taiyang in the domain of the lung. The skin is the exterior orifice of the lung. So in this symptomology, the first thing that you should do is to, because the pathogen is sort of trapped in this area of the chest, which is the domain of the lung and also out into the skin, the best way to relieve the disease is to just allow it to, to uh, leave out through, expel outwards through the exterior, right? Diffuse the lung orifice and upon sweating that cold will, will pass through to the exterior. It's a little bit closer to the surface, you could say, than in the Tuan Wu um, uh, methodology, right? Or the Tuan Wu presentation. Now, the second aspect of it is this idea of supplementing two roots again that we saw before. And so supplementing the middle burner and supplementing the lower burner, because obviously, just like in the Tuan Wu method, this person has compromised um, upright chi, right? And we also have to guard against desertion, okay? So he has what he'll, he has another besides thrusting and drying, we'll also see he has anchoring herbs as well. So let's look at the case study here. This is for an asthma sufferer. So we suffer from asthma for 40 years. So any movement causes panting, palpitations, they got poor sleep, bloating um, upon eating, uh, hard, dry stools, the pale com complexion, stoop back, the dark purple lips, and uh, tongue with teeth marks and uh, sticky co coating. All six posts are soggy and weak and disperse upon pressure. So Lee Ko says the original illness was in the exterior, but over time it sort of penetrates inwards, right? Now, the first thing he says is to supplement upright chi with secondary opening of exterior and expelling of the pathogen. So in this particular model, what he does is he actually combines the thrust and the draw together, okay, and also with an anchor. So when he's, I think that's one way that we can look at it. When he's combining right away thrust and draw, he's also adding in these anchor herbs. So, so let's look at this. Um, and that I think helps to um, guard against, you know, any desertion that, that we might see from the thrusting herbs. So he has first off, basically like a Xiao Qing Long Tang base here, right? Um, with a very low dose of Ma Huang, right? Cause he's, he, you know, at first he's, he's very concerned. Um, he wants to open that ex exterior up and allow the, the cold to, to um, move out along the path of least resistance. But the person has very um, weakened upright chi, so you have to be very careful, right? Um, and so then he also uses Zuan Donghua, um, which he uses um, for, for cough. Fuling, which he says is like Fuling Ban uh, Xiao Ban Xiao plus Fuling Tang, basically treating room not just through. Uh, like banxia and these other sort of acrid herbs, um, but using a um, you, uh, draining through through the urine, so treating above above and below. Now, dilong is sort of he, one of his fortress herbs, but for the chest. Okay, so sort of like we had um, wu gong and chen xie for for uh, the chuan method with dilong here. Now we get also to his anchoring herbs. You can call these or sort of his anchoring herbs. He has um, Longo Moli, Si Si, and San, San Zhu are all are anchoring. So because he's using that Ma Huang right away, he's going to anchor at the same time. Now he also has Fu Zi, right? So you have uh, Fu Zi, Gan Cao, um, and Gan Jiang. So again, a little bit like a, a like a Fu Zi, Li Zhong Tang sort of uh, model there, you also have Hong Sun, right? Like Ren Sun. So a similar and different um, sort of sort of model. And the, the main difference being that he's he's right away he's um, doing that exterior release because the, the pathogen is a little bit closer to the surface. Now after the first uh, five packets, 
the patient has a sweat and all the symptoms improve, but that panting remains. So he immediately removes the ma huang and then increases the foods to 120. So that ma huang, obviously, it does a, it does a number. It, it opens up that exterior and allows a path for that cold to, to expel. But at the same time, it does a number on the upright chi, right? So then he increases his uh, the supplementation. So then after another five packets, um, the, the morning, in the morning, the patient starts to have a productive phlegm that they didn't have anymore. And they have a slight sweating, a pulse is moderate. And so for, for Lika, this is a sign that the upright chi is now able to expel that pathogen on its own. And so what he does then is he goes now to, he pivots to a draw method. Okay, so he does this foods li zhong tang plus anchoring herbs, right? Plus basically what you could call like a bao wei wan. Or, and so again, this idea of supplementing the middle and lower, right? In these um, intractable diseases uh, to really help that um, upright chi expel outwards, expel that pathogen outwards. Okay, and so at the fourth visit, visit, all of the symptoms had resided and the patient was ready to go back out into the fields. Now he says, if the phlegm and coughing were exacerbated after the supplementing, then what do you do? You go back to the, to the thrust method again. So, so you would maybe go back to, to something like the... Um, the the Xiao Qing Long Tang method again, and so this is again that that sort of seesaw between um, the draw and the thrust, right? And so if you start to see signs of that upright chi meeting resistance, then you go to the thrust. If you see the fatigue, the lack of appetite, then you go to the draw again. So this is, and then slowly but surely through an iterative process, the pathogen is forced outwards. That's the idea in um, Li Ke's methodology. Now, uh, finally, I just wanted to talk very briefly about the, the process we said in terms of understanding a new system, right? Um, besides the theory, uh, we also want to know about how uh, the practitioner makes decisions about treatment based upon the theory and very importantly, diagnostic criteria, right? So what are these diagnostic criteria for, for latent pathogens? Now, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to get into uh, Wu Xiongzi today, who is another very important uh, latent pathogen practitioner, um, but you can see all of his information um, in this article that I wrote on Gu parasites and latent pathogens on botanical biohacking. So. Uh, Wu Songzhu has a very sophisticated um, uh, method of, of diagnostics for, for latent pathogens, um, including tongue and pulse findings. So I encourage people to look at that. In terms of Li Ke, Li Ke takes a broader approach. So for Li Ke, he wants to, to emphasize two things. The first thing is that a lot of times in these illnesses, um, whether it be something like uh, lupus or um, things like, uh, like, for instance, he says a coron coronary artery disease or even things like uh, allergies, a lot of people will overlook or they won't even think about the, the possibility of there being an exterior pathogen involved, right? But for, for Liko, what he's found is that a lot of these things, a lot of these latent pathogen diseases really all started with some, with some sort of exterior disease, right? Some exterior pattern. They got a cold, they got whatever, some, you know, some sort of viral infection, right? And so ultimately, if these are going to heal, and this he even believes for things like Crohn's and stuff like this, it has to come by pushing that um, pathogen out through the exterior, right? And so importantly, when we're trying to identify latent pathogens, we should look for these 
signs of there being an exterior pathogen. They might not be so obvious though. So Liko says, sometimes you have to look for just little things. Like for instance, he says, lack of sweating in just one part of the body, right? Maybe the head doesn't sweat, right? Or maybe the back doesn't sweat. Or maybe there's a lack of sweating after eating, okay? Or maybe this heaviness in the shoulders and the back, right? So this is, this is a, a really cool one that sometimes people really look over. But even that, that shoulder and back thing, you know, it's not necessarily always um, like a, a Xiaoyang pattern, um, but it, that heaviness might just be the, the result of, of, of a Taiyang, this exterior sort of remnant there. Oppression in the chest again, right? Because he said uh, the chest is, is sort of the, the um, pivot point of, of Taiyang, right? And heaviness anywhere throughout the body. You can always think that maybe there is an aspect of this being a remnant exterior pathogen. Now, the next really important thing for Lika is what we were talking about in terms of activation of upright chi, right? One thing is this cold invading, the other is activation of upright chi. So at sim if the symptoms manifest at particular times, this is often a sign that typically the upright chi is too weak to move against the pathogen. But because of certain energetics at different times, we can see the, the upright chi being activated. So for instance, uh, he has a case where running piglet cough and cough occurs at zi time, right? Zi is when yang uh, revives and heavy in, right? So we get this sudden activation of, um, of upright chi. Another prior to men menstruation, so that latent pathogen is in the blood chamber, right? And all of a sudden we get all this blood stores, um, which you can think of as sort of this ing chi, which is again, upright chi, um, moving down into that area. And now all of a sudden uh, we get this, this struggle or this resistance. And so he has a case where a patient who, who had had SLE for many years, he first used uh, Danggui Sini Tang, and then he uses Xiao Chai Wu Tang, which is uh, to drive that that pathogen up out of the out of the blood chamber. Okay, uh, other things like major nodes at winter and summer solstices, right? At winter, it's sort of like the zi time of the year. So again, we get this um, at at the solstice there. We get all of a sudden this re return of upright chi. So we might see a problem there. So all of these, like I say, are signs of um, upright chi being activated. So if we have these two major categories in mind, then we can um, maybe look to, to apply these methodologies in clinic for some of these more difficult cases. Otherwise, in Lika's opinion, if you don't expel that pathogen out through the um, exterior, all the clearing heat, all the, um, you know, phlegm, Re resolution, all of the uh, blood moving is not going to do anything because you're not opening up a path outwards, right? So that was a very, very short um, overview of, of Lika and of the idea of latent pathogens in general. Again, I, I encourage you to check out um, my article um, for botanical biohacking, which goes deep into Wu Xiongzi. And of course, I think we'll eventually have a course on, on the Academy of Source-Based Medicine um, on this very important topic. Um, so look out for that in the future too. And with that, I just wanna say thank you for, for listening and uh, hope you got something out of it. Thanks.